So what, what you are seeing here is the, the following of the class of the recognition method. You can recall, of course, in this batch, several sections, several phrases. Uh, of course, the gesture have to be different enough so that you, you don't have two paths uh, falling at the same at the same time, and making sure that you're going to be able to distinguish between the, between the two. Uh, but it, it's working pretty well, and we're using this for essentially for both those recognition. Uh, this module is going to be used as a kind of a wristwatch, and the sensor uh, the sensors are no more on the ball itself, but we, we are measuring the, uh, the the sensors directly on the wrist and trying to recognize the ball strokes. With, uh, with this. this is a very uh, strange way to stop, but I think my time is over. So maybe we can go for Good um, afternoon. My name is Massimo and I'm one of the co-founders of the Arduino project. So today I'm going to explain to you a little bit uh, why we made Arduino, how that happened, and what was the goal that we had when we made uh, this platform. Uh, just to start with, normally I work with designers, so the, the work that I do is kind of maybe much more in a way made for designers. I also a number of representations for very more specifically for musicians, but in a way for performance. But as a lot of people use Arduino also for that kind of stuff. But some of the examples of applications that I will show you are a lot in the area of more design. Um, yeah, this is some <laughs> pictures of Arduino. Uh, this is a, yeah, this was this is a picture taken by this. French guy called Jean Baptiste Labrit as a series called All Art Section. He took a lot of pictures of Arduino boards in the countryside and little girls and bodies. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so Arduino is a platform for physical computing. That's how, you know, you know the design of what they call this kind of discipline. Um, that, that, that we designed because we wanted something that was super cheap and very easy to use because we wanted uh, as many people as possible to be using the platform. And um, so in a way, we're going <clears> to <throat> kind of design the price before we actually design the ball. Because the goal at the beginning was to make it cost 20 euros, which in a way, since the beginning was more or less designed for students, the idea that if you have you know, 20 euros you can spend, you can buy more than one, you can make multiple objects. But if what you use costs 100 euros, then you buy one and maybe, you know. So, the Arduino team is composed of these five people. <laughs> we don't have an official picture, so each one of them is different. <laughs> <laughs> so that's we should hire the guy who got the middle one on the top. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, apart from that one, all the other pictures were different. Anyway. Okay, that's the big Cortez, the one that is uh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> there is a um, Spanish, um, he teaches in Malmo in Sweden, but he's Spanish from Saragossa. And, um, and um, that's David Mendes, who is from the US, but he lives in, uh, in Copenhagen at the moment. This is Tom Igo, which is kind of well known in the world of physical computing, because he wrote the book Physical Computing, and he teaches at NYU, IPD. And that's Gianluca Martino, who's from, uh, from Ibrea. And he's the one who kind of deals with all the manufacturing and the engineering of the electronics. So, um, Arduino is composed of three, three or four, three main parts. One is the board itself, which is a simple microcontroller board that uses this um, processor called ADR um, from a company called Hutner, <coughs> which I don't want to start a religious war here, but it's kind of, in, in some ways, it's much easier to use than the The architecture is much more reasonable, and also you have like very good free compilers that run on every one. Because one of the issues that we had when we designed Arduino is that we wanted it to be run, to be able to run on every platform. And for example, the PIC only has, most of the compilers are only running on Windows, and you kind of have to pay for that. So, uh, while here you have good, C compilers that run open source, that run on every platform. <coughs> so we make it start, we can run from the beginning on Mac, Windows, and Linux. Then the second part is the 
is the development environment, which in a way tries to be as simple as possible. It only has six buttons, and we can always kind of debate if there's one button that we can take away to make it five buttons, because we want also the UI to be extremely simple, because a lot of these tools that people use, especially the students that are learning, or even designers, artists, they're normally designed for engineers. They have lots of menus that you don't need. They are, the UI is badly, badly designed because it's made by engineers. So in a way, it makes you kind of, I'm an engineer, so I can, you know, I can complain <laughs> about this. We don't know nothing. We don't know anything about the UI design. So that's why there are people who are experts on that. But in a way, yeah. And also the third part, in a way, is the, is the teaching model. Um, you know, when I started teaching, since I was trained as an engineer, I started off by teaching the more or less the way that engineers are trained, which is an extremely boring system. You spend five years in university, and you can get a, you know, at least, you know, in Italy, you can get a degree in electronics, five years of university, and not even touch a ball. <laughs> you have to be completely theoretical. So it, it's hell. So when I started teaching, like after a couple of lectures, I realized that it not, was not going to work. Because normally when you teach electronics, you start from the atom and all this stuff, so it's not normal. <laughs> so in a way, I started looking at the fact that I started making electronics when I was about eight years old. So I started, I was, you know, I would take apart everything I could see, and I would, I would just kind of join wires together, and, you know, there was no explosion, there was no design. <laughs> so in a way, that model was something that I tried to kind of implement in the way I was, I was teaching. So here we have a picture of the, of the, ID in all its glory with the classic hello world of this computer, which is blinking an LED. So the moment you can blink an LED, you're an interaction design. <laughs> then it's the Arduino website. The, all the websites in the Arduino constellation are all implemented as wikis because we want to have as much people as possible contributing. And also, I love the documentation that we have is contributed by the users. So it's all about, you know, it's my personal opinion that one, these platforms, they actually kind of have success or not, much more based on the amount of documentation and the ease of use that you can put in than you know, in the power that you can put in the circuit. You can have an extremely powerful circuit and a completely useless circuit. The prime example, the main controller from Make Magazine. You know, it's a powerful piece of hardware, but they don't have a development platform. There's no documentation, and the ID they want you to buy costs $1,000 and runs only on Windows. Tell me if that's the open source kind of, you know, maker's speed. It's completely wrong. So the idea is that openness and, you know, release as fast as possible and have people kind of play around with stuff. So we have a forum that now has uh, quite a few people registered and very active. Also, we started opening forums in different languages because <coughs> we realized that certain people wouldn't realize their full potential until they were communicating in English. When we opened the Spanish forum, it, it's instantly, it started to have more people writing on it than the English forums. Because these people were holding back because they didn't want to communicate in English. They were kind of feeling the same was for the French, and, you know. Like <laughs> no, but I mean, it's, you know, I, mean, I speak English. Then we have this website called The Playground, which is essentially a wiki where anybody can register. There's no control whatsoever, and then you can contribute as much as you like. So all this stuff has been contributed by, by people who use it. So there's like snippets of code, things that people have tried, and how to interface Arduino with any possible language. Of. Clearly, this thing is messy. It's really messy, but it's the beauty of it. It's the messiness. It is the very immediate. The moment when I do a workshop and somebody comes up with a nice piece of code, I tell them, document it now on the playground. No way, do it now. Like, I'm going to watch you and you're going to document it now. <laughs> it's like, I don't know, like a few weeks ago, a guy in Germany wrote a piece of code for Arduino that reads um, these PS2 devices, like the old keyboard and mice. And so he had this kind of barcode reader with PS2's uh, protocol. He wrote a piece of code that lets up the window with barcodes. So I said, okay, I'll document it now. And you can put it on, it's here, it's messy, but it's there, and people can play. Then when the documentation on the playground is kind of stable, we then move it into the main website. And also, 
to keep with this kind of openness in terms of culture, we're now opening up the, the website to translations by other people. So now a team of people in Germany, the University of Potsdam, who are going to be translated in German. It's already being translated in Hungarian. And uh, there is a very, very good Spanish website that has actually sometimes more content than the English website. So synchronizing the content is a bit of an issue. So since I can navigate in Spanish, French, and you know, all it's, it's interesting when the culture of things is reversed. Normally you find more stuff in English than in other languages, and then suddenly on this website stuff in Spanish is really cool. Or there's a French guy who's making this amazing example, but the other people don't understand. So translating between the languages it is a big solution. And also we, we try to make this type of documentation, like this is a booklet that I made that tries to guide people through. And one of the things that I want to do is to have all the illustration drawn by hand because I, we want to give this feeling that it's not kind of polished, it's not, you know, it's not industrial, that it's kind of done by people. You know, that, and actually a lot of people have said that these illustrations that are hand drawn as less intimidating. They're going to they get warm. Well, I saw it completely. Before, when I was doing workshops and I was teaching using like a projector and presentation and stuff, it would take me a certain amount of time to explain things. Now that I give everybody the, the booklet and I say, okay, let's go to page five, I get, you know, I can, I actually do, I kind of gain the day in the workshop. I, can, I squeeze the workshop into the day. So, how this all happened? So I've been teaching for four years at the Interaction Design Institute there, which was an institute that was created in Italy to do interaction design. And uh, Ivrea is the city where the company called Olivetti was. Uh, and Olivetti is important in the story of Arduino because uh, Olivetti uh, was one of the first companies to get design at every level, so in the products, in the graphic design. They used to manufacture a huge amount of computers, so when somebody decided that Olivetti had to essentially die, in Ivrea, suddenly a lot of people set up small companies making electronics. So over there, it's like a 25,000 people city full of electronics engineers that are doing lots of stuff. And um, yeah, so there's lots of interesting connections. In Ivrea, we have traditions for making tools. Like, for example, Casey Rees, who made the processing language at some point, was teaching there. And this kind of generated a bunch of tools that we made. And then you can see a little bit there. This, was, this map was made more or less uh, at, at the beginning of 2006 to kind of map all the work that Ivrea has made in making uh, platforms for people. So I was teaching at the beginning using this basic X, and uh, the platform itself is really powerful, but as I said, the UI is really bad. The software runs only on Windows. The students were having lots of problems running it in virtual PC and stuff like that, so it was kind of excluding some of the students. And also, they were learning how to program in processing, and then they had this problem, and then they had to move to basic. So, you know, you learn French, and then suddenly next month uh, you're doing the next class in Spanish, maybe it's not a good idea. So, we started to look at ways to kind of simplify things. So, as an experiment, one year I made this platform that was based on the big chips. <coughs> Mostly because in Italy it was easier to find because people were using this to hack the satellite subscription. So you know, they were making all these kind of chip things they didn't want to pay you know, to avoid paying the, the satellite subscription. So it was cheap and easy to find. So I made this using this programming language that's actually invented by Dutch called Java, which was the only open source cross platform language for the big. And while I was teaching this for a year, um, we learned a lot of this. Clearly, it was not something that we could continue. But in a way, since when you do something, you never get it right the first time. You always have to kind of experiment. And then you might as well do something and try to see what happens and then you know, see the results. So then we started to think, how can we take the power that the processing language has and translate into electronics? So we started to think about how to make a development environment. If you program this microcontroller using processing. I don't know if you know processing. It's a very simple Java-based language. But it's extremely powerful. It's designed to teach designers and artists how to code. So you can get up to speed in coding in a couple of days. And you can learn proper programming using this thing. It also makes really beautiful things. And there's like an extremely active community, and it's open source and free. So, so we, we one student, 
We did this thesis project called Wiring. And then anybody else uh, who still is working with me and with Casey, and he produced this platform that was called Steel, Steel Paper called, 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 uh, called Wiring. And he was implementing this thing. So you could use processing to program microcontroller. And clearly, this board has the, in a way, problem that it's still expensive. You know, this is like 60 euros plus shipping plus whatever. And in a way, it's got much more stuff <coughs> than you need when you're starting. So it's like oversized for what you need. So in a way, since this, um, you know, we wanted to have something much simpler and much cheaper. So I started to kind of re-implement processing process, it is uh, wiring from scratch huh? in a way where I completely open source because also the student that worked on this didn't want to release it open source immediately, he wanted to have it polished and finished while I'm much more in favor of like just releasing whatever and see what I do. So we kind of re-implemented, so this is like you can see some, some of the first one, this is the first prototype, it's really ugly. But then the advantage of this like for example compared to the pick, that in order to program to program a chip you just need to connect a few wires to a parallel board, and with like 50 cents of a euro, you make your own program for, for, for the board. Right? Well, the pick is a bit more expensive and more complicated. Then the board kind of evolved to have this shape. And then this David Partier just came to the school to do a research project, and we realized we had the same ideas, and we started to work on what then became a dream, and we kind of enrolled these students. Like David Maris was a student, and he's a genius of programming. So we kind of implemented the whole system. And we started to manufacture the first boards. So we manufactured 300 boards. This is a picture of them. The good thing, again, as I said, in Ivrea, there's a very good manufacturer. It's like uh, this, this amazing PCB manufacturer that does amazing work. Huh? And also, if you go there, you will spend half a day because he will have to show you everything. But then you learn a lot about, you know, it's the entire system. You have to go there and become friends, and then you can get the PCGs. You don't just send them on and you get the PCGs. But then in the moment that you become a friend, you learn so much stuff that it's amazing. So the board made an evolution in order to have a more appealing look, because it was for designers, so we wanted to have that blue. Because everything is green in PCB, so we wanted blue. And we wanted to have a funny shape that the PCB manufacturer still now says, can you make it rectangular? No. Because you know, Arduino has this funny shape and it's got to have the shape. <laughs> so we made a serial version which was working pretty well, and then we made a USB version that was full of bugs, but it was still kind of working, and then we kind of took these 300 boards and gave them away as presents to people, just take them. These are the instructions we need. Then we kind of evolved, we made a more beautiful one, and in the meantime, we kind of improved the development of that. Mm -hmm. So we'll take one second to explain a little bit what is kind of different in our community. You will normally, when you program a microcontroller, you would program it in either assembler, which is crazy in the 21st century, or you program it in C, which is really scary for a beginner. Yeah. Then the processing language, which is based on Java, looks very clean, very simple. But then, in a way, Java and C next to each other, they're not that different. So we thought, hmm, maybe we could just take something. You write this program in this language, which looks very kind of simple and nice. And then when you press the button, we take that code, we add some bits before and after, we turn it into a piece of C code, we compile it, and we put it on the board for you. So you are programming in C, but you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so it's the same thing that, you know, somebody gives you, you're flying a plane, when you look, somebody gives you the, you know, the steering wheel, but you, you don't realize you're flying a plane until you look outside, oh my god, I'm flying <laughs> So in a way, the idea was to kind of take away the scary part and make something that you don't realize, but you're actually programming in C. So we kind of took off this nonsense notation that they have in C to kind of turn on and off a pin, which you need like a degree in mathematics. And we, and we use this simple syntax that have not been invented for a while. It was very simple, digital right on off. So we made 200 of these boards where we have the FDDI chip, the terrible FDDI chip, the evil FDDI chip, <laughs> that implements this serial Port, which is actually, in a way, it's not efficient, but it's the simplest thing. So we always went for the simplest thing. On this board, there is practically nothing. There is just exactly what you need to get the microcontroller working. So this thing was manufactured and sold for 20 euros 
the chip is still this kind of old technology you can snap out because you know if you burn the chip, which is very unlikely, probably, I only saw like a couple of people burn the chip. Then you can buy one online for five euros and you can replace it. Because you know, in a way, one of the things that I always hated is like in the 21st century we lost completely this idea that you can fix things. You know, your computer breaks it all the way. No, you fix it. You take this out and you replace it. And then when I bought them, ah what? <laughs> There's an image missing, I don't know why, on this board, which is the latest one that we made. But <laughs> the only thing that you should know is that in the meantime, we became better and better engineering. So the, this one, we made 200. Then of this one, we made uh, 3,000. And now this new one called NG, which means more general, it's a new generation, let's say. We made about 6,000. So now we're reaching the 10,000 pieces sold, and we are launching you a production of a new board that we are already producing in 10,000 pieces because it was selling it. It's, I mean, a lot of people have liked the idea, the fact that it's simple and it's kind of cheap. And also everything is open source. If you go to the website, you can actually download the design for every board. So some people are actually making their own board. Like this Japanese guy, he made his own board. And I, I feel it out one because I was looking for Arduino on Flickr and I found this. He made his own board, like he, you know, the one he liked in the format. He was teaching a class on using Arduino, the software to program a board that was not our board, which is the great part. It's more like this guy from Bogota, he downloaded the files and then he removed the name in Italy and replaced it with in Bogota. <laughs> <laughs> But it does, it left my name. <laughs> so this is also good about things that we, you know, you can download the files and you can manufacture them in your country if manufacturing buying from Italy is too expensive. I mean, we had to set up a distributor in the US because the taxes for people buying just one Arduino from the US were ridiculous. So we actually went for Spark Fun because Tom Iger is a friend of this guy. So you know, but because also they are the most important one used by all the experimenters. This is Chile. Some people in Chile decided to have a class, and clearly they could not afford uh, you know, getting the boards for Italy or the US. So they actually etched the board. Consider this board is a dual sided board, so it's got tracks on both sides. So do, to do this by hand, it, it's like it's craftsmanship. It's like, you know, this is like the Sistine Chapel. You know, it's like beautifully <laughs> handy. Actually, for this type of experimentation, we actually also designed a board where the tracks are only on one side. It's slightly bigger, but you can actually do it in a very low-tech uh, kind of way. And actually, some Chinese people have started making their boards like that. They hatch them in the kitchen. And... Also, since the design is available online, some people can download it and then customize it to make their own application. So one of my students, for example, was doing a project for Mattel, and he changed the logic inside the remote control car. So he designed the Arduino board that you could fit in, in, instead of the control board inside the remote control car. And this is good because this guy actually never made PCBs before, but I, I, I gave every student like a half day introduction on how you do your own PCB using this CAD software called Eagle, which is free, and runs on Windows, Macintosh, and Linux. And, um, and then after like a few days, he came up with this beautiful piece. And it actually works. Sorry? That was the first time this person ever designed a board? Yes. Ooh. Unbelievable. Yeah, well, well. I tell you, he was only an he's only electronics engineer. He studied computer science and, and cinema. So, okay. I mean, he's good. Yeah. The, the, all the students, he's got the, what in time we say, to have the hand. He's got the hand for this. You know? The other students make beautiful PCB, but he always had, well, had the touch of making all these nice yeah. words and, you know, this kind of hatched pattern. <laughs> <laughs> then we have to prototype with other things. So this is like, a, we make lots of prototypes. Because since we have this good connection with the PCB guy, sometimes when we have to do pro PCBs for, for my customers, I throw in some prototypes so that uh, we can utilize the, the panels. So this is a prototype of the Bluetooth board that we ended up not making because the, the, the Bluetooth module was <laughs> and then uh, this one is the prototype of the one that we're going to be selling starting from Christmas. This, this is the pre-production prototype that has been handled back 
this is the red, the red boards are our kind of internal limited edition. And once the red boards are working, we go, we make the new ones. Yes, we're a bit of a design designers. This one is a very nice module that has, uh, they can reach 100 meters, so it's much more powerful than the standard one. And it's very rich, it's got a lot of possibilities, but it's also very simple to program. So we're now making a bunch of examples, because what we do normally, we just generate a lot of examples, because you know, people normally like to take an example and kind of get custom and hack it away until they get what they want. Instead of like, because the manual for this thing is really complete, but even I sometimes are like, like pages and pages in this PDF to explain something. They, with an example, you could explain it like for half a page, it's 10 pages of like Finnish um, description. The details. This is about that of the Ethernet board. Like a number of the boards that we can, they become Arduino are boards that maybe we make for some customer. I made this for a customer for an exhibition in Milan because I use OSC. I kind of borrow the OSC protocol but I use it to, to distribute data when I do this issue. So I have a number of these boards reading sensors and sending data using OSC. So this is like the evolution, and again, we, can, we will start selling it. This one, for example, is another board that we made. Some people started to ask us for a very tiny board, like this one. So we thought, why don't we make it in the same shape of the basic stand, which is like the most common platform on the market, which is ridiculously expensive, because it's a 10 year old product that costs 76 euros. And it's it's slow. It's slow, it doesn't have analog inputs. I mean, people use it because there is a huge amount of documentation. You know, you can't go wrong with that. If you're a teacher and you are lazy, you just buy the basic stamp and there's like loads of manuals you can use. Only idiots like me invent new things. <laughs> the others just buy the basic stamp and the book and they then they go home. <laughs> so you can actually use the Arduino Mini instead of the basic stand. <laughs> 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 the oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> same thing. Yeah, well, if you want to improve the performance of something you already made with the basic stand. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the power of open source. I mean, the, the design for this thing is available online. You can download it. <laughs> then we started to look at this. How do we extend this platform? So we came up with this idea of making these modules that you can kind of stack on top of this. Because a lot of the people that use this platform, they don't want to waste time like fiddling with breadboards like crazy. They want stuff to use plug. So we made this one with a session. You can plug on top of the board and then you can build your own circuit here. And then we start to make a bunch of others. Like for example, this is a sensor that can measure the heartbeat and the skin resistance of two people. And I used it in an installation. And after I made the installation, I made the module and it's This is a module that has a bunch of sensors. It was made by Marco Sciatta, who is a guy from the University of Saragossa. He was working in Marmor. He did his kind of final project in Marmor. So there's a CPU module, accelerometer, some LED, some buttons, some light sensor, the temperature sensor. That essentially, this thing has got all the sensors you can imagine. So you can kind of experiment with everything. Clearly, you don't get the latency and the precision of all the stuff that you saw today. But you know, if you are starting, it's just like a this is a motor control board, so this kind of can control two motors in speed and direction, so it's used by people who do small robots or things like that. This is a prototype of a module that can control uh, lights. So since we do a lot of exhibition, we have the need to control lights, so to turn on and off and dim lights. So this one will be sold as a product, not that you have to mount it yourself, already mounted, and you can snap it, and you can control four different light channels. Since this thing probably will cost uh, 20 euros when it's finished, and that you know, board cost 20 euros, with 40 euros you can control, and you can program four channels of light, which is a lot less than using some DMX board. Then, by the way, we also have the DMX controller, and there is a piece of code on the Arduino website where you can do DMX from Arduino. Then the Graffiti Research Lab, they made an Arduino, these modules are called SHIELD, because Arduino used to be the king of Italy, so David had this idea that this could be the shields for the king. <laughs> <laughs> so they made these shields, they can drive up to 16 groups of LEDs, so they use it for these interactive graffiti they make. I don't know if you saw the videos online, they kind of spray paint, uh, this magnetic paint, and then they stick LEDs onto the graffiti, and then it blinks. Check it out, graffiti is so amazing. 
They're the people who have made the LED toys. Oh, yeah, anyway. Also, Arduino started to look out for other projects that similar philosophy where we can start to have some alliances. So we start to collaborate with other. Well, this is a picture from a workshop. It's a collaboration. These are Arduino powered boxing gloves. When you hit them, <laughs> they go ouch. <laughs> they took a little module from a pair, and you can record the sound, and then they hook it up to Arduino. So when you punch, you punch somebody else, they go ouch. So for example, these two architects, one is British and the other one is Hungarian. They made this fantastic book that tells you how to take Chinese toys, take them apart, and make interactive stuff out of them. This is like the essence of the Arduino idea. Just, just take whatever is available. You know, forget about how the engineers work. That's what the engineers. If you are a creative person, you need to get the result quickly. Take stuff to be using. So hacking toys is a great thing. They wrote the book, so we became friends. So now we do workshops together. So they sometimes start they are really worship by teaching people how to hack the toys. And these toys are simple. In like half a day, some people that don't have any knowledge at all, they start to make interactive stuff. So when they move on to a wheel, they're not so afraid of like maneuvering electronics. Because they have been killing cats all day. The cat is interactive. When you tap it, it starts to meow and the uh, eyes start to meow. <laughs> That's a fantastic sensor. Then pure data, again, was like a great inspiration for us. And then, we started to work with Hans Christoph Steiner, that actually when he was at Stein, he made a project where he actually built an object that you can incorporate into pure data, and you can talk to Arduino. So it, there is this kind of standard piece of software that runs on Arduino. And then you do all the processing inside pure data. So you don't program the board anymore. You just have this object that has all these inputs and outputs, and you tell the object, tell Arduino, please, to tell me what's on pin number five. So if you're starting off, you don't want to learn how to program Arduino, then you just plug it in and you use it. So since the protocol was fairly well designed, then this other guy, Benedict, made an object that does the same thing for the VDD language. VDD language is an amazing product. So again, using the same framework that was designed for pure data in VDD, you can control the Arduino board without having to program the hardware. You stay in the visual language. So this other guy from Art Plus Com in Berlin made the same object for processing. So now, uh, once the protocol is perfectly defined uh, to the last bit, uh, we will start shipping the Arduino boards with this software already burned on the chip. So if you're a complete beginner and you know, for example, to use how to use pure data, you just take the board, you plug it in, you fire up pure data, you type Arduino, the Arduino object is already distributed with the latest pure data, so you can operate without problem. So now I'll show you a few examples of things that people have done. It's a bit, there's no particular order. We don't really have a list of what people have done with Arduino because there's like already like 6,000 boards already out there, so it's a bit difficult to figure out. So it's, yeah, so this, for example, is what we did. It's an exercise that some students made in a workshop in a day. They made a lamp that changes color depending on what chewing gum you put on it. These were students that were graphic design students, so in a workshop that lasted a few days, they were able to make this in a day. This is a Chinese guy who made a robot that's controlled by Arduino and Bluetooth, so he has a flash application that controls Arduino through Bluetooth and controls that robot that looks like a bit like a I don't know, like a strange animal, yeah. And then he has this fancy software where he can actually look. Uh, look at Arduino to a webcam and then get some data from the robot and control the robot from this button. Now this is our project, the DDK3. It's a, kind of, it's a nice project. You take a dancer, you hook up all the leaves to this uh, Arduino board, and this kind of generates electric shocks to the muscles in a certain sequence. So it makes the person dance, and the dance is decided by Arduino. It's a the, the classic project is like, this guy is a musician, so he made some kind of tangible UI for the software using Arduino. Clearly, maybe the resolution and the precision is not very high, but you know, it's about some recycled wood and some more. So we also have like modules that let Arduino speak MIDI, so you can see here like an Arduino board. 
talking for a bunch of minutes. This is again Kate Lee. Then some people at Hungary, Barcelona, they made this uh, thing called six pack. It's an Arduino board that has a module that's plugged on top with six, six sliders. And they made a piece of software that runs on the computer. You can use these six sliders, a simple controller for applications or sound. Again, it's an open source thing. You can download the design. This is another project. This girl, she's a designer and she makes books. So she started to make the covers of these books interactive by putting sensors and also motors hidden away inside this fabric to kind of give haptic feedback to people that were touching the book. And also depending on how you touch, this MP3 player gets triggered and you can hear different things. So you can see the electronics, underwear, and the board. <clears throat> At the beginning, we had the students assemble their own Arduino board, but it's, especially with the USB ones, the rate of failure is very high. While with the manufacturer that we have in Ivrea, we can produce in Italy at a reasonable cost, and we practically get like 1% of failed board. But since we test them all one by one before we send them out, I mean, the failed ones, you know, they don't go out. You know. The only ones that arrive, the very, very few ones that are damaged are damaged in transport. Sent a few of them, a few of them to London a few months ago, and they arrived with all the LEDs missing. And this means that probably parcels were also shaking on the, the, the circuits and walking on them. This is an installation where you can take these trees, take them into the woods, right, record some sounds, and bring them back. <laughs> and then when you touch the metal, you hear. It's like a, these are all like school projects. So I'm going to skip quickly. This is a project that we did for this. Um, festival that's in Genoa every year in Italy for kids. So Telecom Italia has to get the kids in there, but what they have is kind of boring. So they, we got this thing that you have to pick up all these little fish that are colored. And when you have the six fish, you can get into this magical. And when you put the color fish in one of the slots on this thing, the, the fish of that color will start to swim. So you put the red fish and this red fish has to start to swim. It's very simple to do this for kids. But it was extremely successful and it was very simple because instead of having like something complex like barcode or and if it is, we just use color. So we made this kind of super simple color sensor. And um, so they just shine a color light on the object and they measure how much light comes back. It's super low tech, very cheap and works. These are more serious stuff. It's uh, like prototypes that we built for our team. It's like a big lighting company that makes fancy design of lamps. So and these are all powered by different types of Arduino boards. We made customized Arduino boards for this. So this is a lamp that you control by kind of sliding your hand in and out. Or this one, ah, there you can see, like, there's like a rubber thing at the bottom. And you squeeze it, and you can turn on and off the lamp, and you can charge it enough by squeezing this thing. But see, this thing is all kind of translucent plastic. You can see there's nothing inside. But this is magically, you don't really see where the switch is. But there is a pressure sensor, and the Arduino board is in here. Well, this is like an LED portable lamp that has this key to change the color. And this is like a customized Arduino board that uses like an iPod style sensor. The code to read the sensor is available on the, on the website. And this is like a customized Arduino board that was made specifically for that thing. I mean, one of the things that we developed that we kind of use when we do consultancy projects, that when we work with customers, we can design a board and have it manufactured in five days. So when we make a prototype, we don't give them this, we don't give like wires going all over the place, but we give them, give them that. And that kind of helps in making stuff that you can This is a project that a student of mine made that it was the idea to turn anything into a controller for games. So again, it's like a customizer of the Wino board with a wireless transmitter. Clearly the latency, okay, the latency is terrible, but, but the project is fine. So you can control, for example, by moving around in the chair. Mm -hmm. I'm going to skip a few of these projects. Like this is a product I made that's actually on sale. It's an RFID-driven video player that can be used to make exhibition. This is an exhibition for a watch manufacturer where you kind of have all these objects. You place an object on a table, and then the video gets played. Or this was at the Salon del Mobile in Milan, somebody made this punch bag, and you punch, and then the Arduino reads all the signals and kind of distorts a 3D model and then makes a, an object for you. So when you want to buy a vase, for example, you can shape the vase by punching this thing. 
<laughs> and so we kind of figure out how to read 96 analog inputs from the Arduino and send the data to a 3D model, and then the 3D printer makes the, 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 the hand of the part. These are like customized LED displays that we made for, for Whirlpool. We made the version <coughs> where we made all these kind of prototype of future types of uh, appliances. So we made all these kind of fancy scrolling LED displays with tiny LEDs. I will skip. This is a sample computer. It's an illustration made by Fabrica using the green wall detecting people moving. This is the Hungarian Pavilion at the Biennale. It's all about, there's a bunch of Arduino boards controlling all the Chinese toys. So when you enter this space, all these Chinese toys start to move. So the penguins start to talk and the scars start to move. And this. So then we were lucky that we got published on, on May magazine. So we got a lot of visibility, and so that kind of helped us a lot. We, we also won an honorable mention at the same time. You will see the being being completely. <laughs> And then somebody started to say, maybe Arduino is the basic stuff here. Because it, the cost is kind of slightly less. So who's, who's using Arduino? It's like a small selection of people who's using Arduino. I don't really know exactly who it is. The list of customers is very long. And, uh, but there's a number of schools that use it around the world. And we made workshops all over the place. So we have lots of different things. But we, there's lots of people that make a Arduino workshop that we don't know about. Sometimes I'm like browsing the web and I see, oh, there's a Arduino workshop in Brussels. Then I look at the name of the guy who's in the workshop. I don't even know the guy. <laughs> He's running the workshop. Yeah. So the future is to develop more boards. So we're going to release the Bluetooth. We're going to have the Ethernet. At the beginning, the Ethernet will only have an OSC-based firmware. So you won't be programming the chip through the Arduino environment, this is a bit complicated to deal with all that TCP and stuff, but there will be a, like an OSC based field that we can talk to. And also we're experimenting with making different products using Arduino for this and we track the three player. And also we're looking at this kind of things like this for example is a it's a board that's based on the VX thing. So essentially this is the core of a PDA that you can actually snap onto your own motherboard. So you can make your own motherboard. And all the complicated stuff is on this little module. And this can this runs Linux and Windows. So we use it for our own customers. But uh, you know, when we could easily port our environment to program this. So when you start to program this Linux box with an environment that only has six buttons, and you don't have to worry about how the things work, because everything is kind of hidden away from you, then it starts to become easy also to use these kind of more complex things. This thing also has like audio in, audio out. So the last slide, everybody asked me where the Arduino name comes from. It's a king of Italy, but actually it's the name of a park. Sometimes <laughs> <laughs> you might remember this oh, park. Yeah, it's in the triangle square. It's, you know, there. And this, yeah, when we had to pick a name for the board, we only had like five minutes because the manufacturer was on the phone. So we had like, what do we do, what do we do? And then I said, okay, let's make Arduino. Because in Ivrea, everything is Arduino here, Arduino there, because it was the king, so. So that's how Arduino happened, and it's it started in January 2005, and now, you know, after we're approaching two years now, and it's been we never expected to be so successful. Very cool. <laughs>
ask some of the opinions of the users, and I maybe I'll ask somebody from the meta group. Um, if you could summarize you know, what, why you guys as the users get together and why you, you know, create workshops. And Sorry, it's when it is? This year? May this year. May, yeah. And uh, there's basically uh, some people from the previous uh, weekly meeting at uh, the Bath Society in Amsterdam and Comics. Um, there are some people uh, from different backgrounds, artistic backgrounds and technical backgrounds who are toying with the idea of using uh, some hardware for their projects instead of only doing software based stuff sitting behind the screen, making tangible physical devices. And so we have uh, bi weekly meetings to exchange ideas, to show uh, each other's work, and to discuss problems and 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 just you know uh, socialize and, and learn from each other's mistakes and demonstrate uh, uh, burned out transistors, blinking LEDs, uh, LCD displays, and all kinds of interactive devices. It's uh, it's about learning and experiencing. Uh, Learning with doing, not just from theoretical textbook approach. Yeah, and ex exchanging the knowledge you have and, and learning from each other. That's one of the important things. Yeah. So we, also, we, we all know just a little part, but <coughs> by bringing together the knowledge and, 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 and the toy project you have, uh, yeah, we try to educate ourselves. And we have uh, a wiki and a mailing list to. Uh, and we are completely open for anybody who's interested to, to join in. Uh, we have organized now three workshops this year. And there will be another one in probably in January. Uh, different uh, people are um, showing their their work and their uh, experience in using different kind of types of electronics and software from their different backgrounds. Like uh, also Arduino based material. Traditional analog electronics, digital electronics, uh, sound, sound stuff like oscillators, amplifiers, filters, and that kind of stuff. So I think for the typical is I think nobody's against. Yeah. Excuse me, you're saying you're willing to learn as much as you can, but like yeah, five, five, five minutes ago, you, five easy. minutes ago, you say I already have enough problems with my sound speed. No, I don't have problems. Well, problems like it already gives me enough hassle to use No, 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 it doesn't give me a hassle. No. But what was the point then? Well, the point is that um, I think it will be useful for artists if it's kind of like for the artists. Yeah. Um, that people are really putting power into this, in these workshops that, um, you know, uh, that I stand about um, to try to educate these artists. Um, and maybe then you can talk about but, and, and also, Martin will tell me how these workshops can really drain you. And there are these kind of problems dealing with such a different level of technology. So, I mean, what, what are your thoughts about Well, the way I see it is it's kind of two choices. You have two choices as a designer of an instrument. You can make a, a prototyping platform, which is what I do for the class, and the same with Arduino. I mean, they're very similar in aspects to the Kui and Arduino. I mean, I just have made my own version is has some different attributes. They're very similar in a lot of other ways, though, because of their goals behind them, which is a teaching platform and research a little bit. But when you're, you know, if you're making your own instrument, that's where either it becomes, I mean, a lot of people want that to be a personal thing, and that's why the workshops end up being so successful on all sense. They want it to be their own, very personal. They built it, and they understand it. They're the only ones to perform with it. But I would actually advocate, as I said in my talk, that it's, you know, that's one way to do it, and it's perfectly valid. There's a perfectly valid, maybe seemingly a little bit, not forgotten, but less paid attention to these days, which is where you have a luthier. And, you know, musicians should expect to pay, as they had for traditional instruments, a lot more than for an Arduino or a Kui, because if you're getting something with the sensors fully integrated, all figured out, the engineering is completely done for you. A traditional violin, you know, I paid $18,000 for my violin, the acoustic one. I would probably sell my own, if, if somebody eventually, they may want to buy an overtone violin, I would probably sell it somewhere around there. It's, Sorry, you know, it's, it's yeah. what you that's what you get. It's 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 true. It's it's also an answer to, to the question of how much electronics should I learn. If you if you want to buy a twenty dollar Arduino board and a three dollar light sensor, you have to solve them together. 
If you want to do something else, you go to the shop and you buy a $500 integrated light sensing go on DB dimension beam box thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's your choice. Money or time. It's, always yeah, it's also a question of looking for the luthier version. It's not their main thing in life, playing the instrument. Right. Uh, which, but I, I, was a tradition, I wouldn't even bother to try to make money from this far. Yeah, yeah. But what we're proposing is to make these same... Same. One level of expertise is that you know how to use the sensors, you know what they can provide. But then the length of the cables that you have on your pre-wired sensors, it's always too short. So <laughs> you want more. So what are you going to do? Are you going to go back to the company and say, OK, I would like to, to have a double length. And, and maybe the company is going to do it for you, and you're going to pay again. But maybe you're going to follow this the second level of expertise and try to understand how you can extend your current system and, and go step by step this way. That, I think that raises a really interesting question that I'm always thinking is that when when the artists make that step, whether it's a practical step or a financial step. Um, uh, I mean, do you, do you think, does anybody think that there is some kind of benefit for the artistic expression or the output of what the artist does? I mean, if you talk to somebody like Nick Collins, he's all about the little, you know, sine wave that you made. And that, that rewarding feeling is something, I mean, it, it, you don't want to listen to anybody else's sine wave or anybody else's wave. You can get eat, but it's so important that you gain that experience. And that kind of leads to, it, it's worth it for the artist to take that step. That's so exactly what this meta is all about. That you actually have to build it yourself to get this satisfaction. And you could buy maybe a similar device or similar off the shelf. And maybe you don't be in that sense of money. And, but it gets more satisfaction to spend maybe even um, three weeks no? or four weekends on it to build something really simple. But it gives so much more satisfaction because you build it yourself. Not just about, about knowing your medium that, that you work in. As an artist, I think you have to know the medium you work in. If you, you try to make something in a medium you don't know, you often kick in an open door and, and make something that is very obvious for anybody who's been working in it. But you can argue that both ways as well. If I'm on my plug in, but it's, uh, I mean, I'm probably hands on too, but but at the same time, um, when you make a sine wave, you're already kicking down on the door as well, you know, it's not like, uh, uh, and it's also very interesting to have the possibility to um, really work with, work with somebody who's going to be able to customize something on one side, uh, because the, the, the way I've been hearing things, there are, there are I didn't quite agree with the idea that there are two different things. One is you get something you sold on the wires and, and that's something. And the other one is you buy it off the shelf. There is another uh, there is another alternative which is kind of maybe corresponds to the V2 um, proposal, uh, which is that you maybe need to, uh, and which is also kind of the Linux open source model where you can get something which is which works really well, which corresponds specifically to your purpose, which obviously you, know, you need to know what it is. So you need to have some kind of comprehension of the, of the technology and so on, even just to be able to say what it is that you want this thing to do. But then somebody is going to come in and they're going to ta tailor build something for that. But which isn't, to my mind, either the same thing as uh, uh, lootery, uh, because it's almost always a prototype, which means that you need a really kind of high degree of expertise from somebody to be able to um, I mean, it's like when you get a, a, a you, you want somebody to set up a Linux box for you to do one specific installation, and you can do that. You can you can save money uh, by actually using a really cheap computer, but by getting somebody in who knows really how to program that thing so that they can get all the the, the, the best performance out of the machine, and for the, for the, the, a quarter of the price of a, of a Macintosh, you can get a Linux box which is going to be uh, doing the same job, but you're going to have to pay, pay the guy to come and do the development to, to, to set the whole thing up and so on. In touch with it. So there was a, an incredible need to open this up and to hack stuff and to do stuff. Now over the years, like in many other areas, you can see that, that 
it, it has gone into scenes, it has developed in many directions, many people have chosen directions, and there's people now that can also say, well, I want to build further on that experience. You don't have to always redo everything if it suits you. I, I think uh, you, you should need the instrument that, that allows you to carry your ideas somewhere. And the problem is uh, that we live in, in a time where the media, indeed, you know, the, the, the type of tools you use becomes part of that message so clearly that sometimes for reason of the message, you simply don't want to use a certain tool or you want to make your own or you want to choose a tool. And this is the point that the V2 philosophy <coughs> that Alex Aliat has made, you know, this is like an instable media period where uh, in the past, you know, the, the technology would remain there for centuries, sort of slightly changed in a slow speed and now changes are so fast that do you have to go along? As you know personally, I like to stop the development and say, no, I stick to some technology for a while so that I get to know it and I, I can become a partner. Another person might say, no, I want to learn a new technology. I want to plug in this time with a soldering, another time. I mean, that it's all part now of, of your statement in a way. And it's, an, it's a bit of an um, older idea that you could say, oh, I want an instrument and I'll play with it for the rest of my life, which maybe I'm doing, I hope. <laughs> but on the other hand, I see a lot of people uh, that really want to make it their statement to come with a specific instrument. But contrary to that, if we look at Stein over the years, in the beginning we had all these people that had to, had to spend all their time with doing this technology stuff and diving into it and had a huge problem in getting their mindset back in the artistic uh, area, being on stage, because for them sometimes it was too extreme to bring together. And now more and more we see people that, yeah, can I get this ready made because I want to go on stage, and that's where the real thing happens. I mean, this is totally on, in the contrary with, with what I'm personally saying, but it's, I think um, the good thing of what has happened is that there's not a unified path anymore that we all follow. There's people that will say, well, develop an instrument for every piece you make, or maybe every day a new piece. Other people might say, no, like one of the projects we want to do at this time, which until now nobody's really doing, is build the simplest possible instrument that you can, you know, imagine to make sound and give that to maybe six people and ask them to play with it for two years. <laughs> You know, what happens in different habits? How will people develop personal style with using a totally simplistic instrument? It's a very interesting research, I think, to do. I mean, it's totally against what we said like 20 years ago, where we said, no, every person should have its own instrument. But right now, where everyone has a personal instrument, and it could be very interesting to say, okay, let's do that. So the, the great liberty now is to, to have your own way with instrumentalism. And that's also why why Stein, in a way, is totally happy to have so many different voices today. Different business opportunities, maybe in the case of Lisa, if you provide with the program presets that all just work right out of the box, but someone like, like me will also edit and edit and edit and create my own, uh, I think you could have an analog to that in, in yeah. your business. It's, it's, it's also a question of it's a distinction between the different kinds of users who have Precisely. different demands. Precisely. So the one person is happy with the Lisa sample with the standard yeah. sounds and wouldn't otherwise be able to use it if it had no sounds in it. And the other person exactly. who is, knows exactly how to edit sounds and filter them and shape them and then stick them in Lisa is a different kind of person who works on a different level. And the same goes for the guitar guys. The guy well, that I, I think in the part, it's not even, it, it doesn't even have to be different persons, but it's a, it's a different um, evolution of this person. Yeah. I, mean, yeah. I began programming computers with putting a, a floppy in it and pressing run, and it gave me plenty of things, and I thought, oh, that's cool. And yeah. now I program it myself, so, and I dig into the kernel and all the, all the, all the yeah. nasty stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a so, personal personal evolution. I'm not saying that doesn't happen, of course, but I'm saying that different people at different points in their careers have different demands, or even at the same point, different demands just for different installations. Yeah. And still, if if you are a Lisa user who wants to edit their own sounds, you have to know about sound editing, you have to know about samples, you have to know about the waveform. 
if you are a, a guitar player who wants to undo and redo this guitar, you have to know the physics of guitar building. If you want to work with sensors, you have to understand them. You have to be able to solder, you have to understand the differences between signals, symmetric signals, asymmetric signals, analog supplies, digital supplies. Or you have to find the person or willing to do it for you. Yeah, so but it's for you still, if I, if I were, I mean, I am a technician, I'm not primarily an artist. If I was working with an experienced technician who knew all that stuff and had to explain it all to me, I would want to remember all of that stuff. I would want to learn so that I don't have to find a person to explain it to me every single time I make a new installation. I must also say that uh, working uh, here, in the beginning, uh, I really trusted the pro previous generation of programmers who we're still good friends with, but it's not the people right now. <laughs> but uh, 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 but the, the crucial thing was that at some point, you know, in order to communicate with them, uh, because the, it, I couldn't judge, you know, and I was running the project, so I couldn't judge what was going on, but whether it was, you know, artistic or, or technically, uh, you know, whatever. So I, I did go into learning basics of, of quite a few uh, programming languages and did li little things and was encouraged by somebody like George Lewis who, who says, you know, in, even though he's like a real stage uh, musician, he says, you know, the programming is like, like writing, writing poetry or people. It's, it's the same realm in a way. And, you know, there's a whole live programming movement right now. But I must say that, that learning basics, which is a you know, yeah, also, also like doing also like funny languages that were around. But it, I think that, that working with, uh, with this team now has benefited from me understanding a little bit more because in the communication you can better understand if the other person understands. But one of the better, some of the better projects that we did here was Frank spending hours and hours with somebody from the puppeteers that I mentioned yesterday or a dancer or somebody who didn't know anything about the technology and really in a good communication like the Renaissance idea that that uh, you have brought back in the one day one dogma here and said, said let's try to forget about this word control because if you think about it we're always interacting yeah. and you can be successful and then you tend to call it control. Yeah, but you were referring to this, this disaster that happened and that then you lose control and that makes you it makes you scared, get dependent on yeah. stuff that you don't understand, and then you your reaction is to try to learn something, yeah. so to regain some But that's control. an interactive that, uh, uh, process. It's an moving. It's an interactive process, like you say. The control, uh, the word control, assumes that you can really master it, and I'm not totally sure you can. And I even like the idea that we can't. Really. Yeah, yeah, true. It's a bit yeah. too much Zen. That's also the other thing that, that you pointed out that the knowledge can actually be an inhibiting factor in creativity, because you know the boundaries too well. And to be totally free, you should know, not know your boundaries. Yeah. You have to find them out while you're going. You have to hit the wall. Yeah. <laughs> we, we can introduce other terminologies, for example, opacity and transparency of interfaces, because um, many engineers discuss now about transparency of interfaces. I think to um, yeah, discuss this transparency, I think the process of opacity or disturbance is very important. It is a little bit similar sense of what uh, Michel um, mentioned, because I think for an artist, it was it's very important to focus on materiality or uh, something not familiar to me. And uh, the interfaces that uh, must be transparent at the end, I think, um, must be uh, focused uh, at the first, for example, from the point of view of materiality. And an artist can um, try to experiment with these interfaces with regard to something that is uh, could be mediated if we introduce the uh, concept of medium. I think medium is very useful in the sense that uh, only in the sense of something what is what uh, transfers um, some something what is pre-given, but uh, in the sense of that what constitutes um, in the interaction a meaning. That means I think. Opacity is very closely connected with the transparency. It's just my um, theoretical argument because transparency could be a little bit uh, problematic if we use the transparency in the sense of medium that transfers just intentions as though uh, they yeah, are pretty given. I don't know if that is clear. Mm -hmm. I think we should. Um
and this round table here, and then bring it to the foyer for some drinks and maybe a more informal session. Um, before we break up, we still have a day of presentations tomorrow.